what I just said. <laughs> Yes, hey, we already recorded. We're already on. We're already on. It's 11 o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Catholic Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson Review for all the teachers. And welcome to our Catholic Missionary Baptist Church. Well, the Reverend Dr. Ellie Campbell is our pastor. And we are blessed to have him as the shepherd, under shepherd of this flock. All right, now I think I'm on now. All right, uh, we have a wonderful lesson this morning. Wonderful lesson. Um, we are uh, uh, in uh, in in prayer with uh, Brother Dave Smith uh, in the loss of uh, his brother, Brother Philip Madison, and so we are uh, going to be in prayer with him. I texted him uh, yesterday or Monday, I believe it was. I think it was yesterday, I just asked him if he needed me to stand in for him, and he, he said that he did, and the irony of this was, uh, I spoke with uh, Lonnie on uh, Sunday, I said, hey man, let me see what the Sunday school lesson is, just in case I have to teach it. <laughs> so I took a picture, took a picture of his uh, Sunday school book, and I said, oh, this is a good one, because we're coming from Romans chapter 3, and then as it turned out, as I was trying to prepare for it, I couldn't come up with anything. And I said, Lord, now we got us a problem here because I got to teach. And uh, yesterday I'm sitting there falling asleep trying to get something together. <laughs> and then the Lord reminded me that I preached on this at one time. And uh, I, I actually went and found that sermon. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach the sermon that I preached uh, back then because, I, I mean, I, I, I was stumped. I was trying to find something. Because... You know, that's what I do. I, I try to ex, be an expositor of scripture, so I didn't want to go to any commentaries. I wanted to get my stuff together first and then go to the commentaries and, and back it up. But uh, I never did make it to a commentary. But uh, the Lord showed, reminded me that I, I, I preached a sermon on this, and uh, I went to my notes for the sermon, and, and quite frankly, I was surprised what I had wrote. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so you get to, uh, you get to, um, I get to teach what I, uh, what I preached. Uh, here we go. Uh, we are in the Sunday School book on page uh, 51. Uh, I need to uh, not belabor this because I need to give the pastor time to preach or to teach this afternoon. Uh, but the Sunday School lesson is found on page 51. Unit 3, Standing in Faith. Uh, the title of the lesson is No Need to Boast. The devotional reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and verses 13 through 17. The background scripture is Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 30. That's what we're going to be talking about. And the print passage is also Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 30. And you see, let's read the king, uh, let's read the key verse together in the King James text. The key verse in the King James text reads, There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The lesson aims, as you see, uh, in your Sunday school book, as a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do the following. Compare being justified by the law and works with being justified by faith in Christ. 
value your faith in Jesus Christ and become intentional about reflecting genuine faith in your daily living. Amen. Uh, that is uh, from the Sunday School book. It has two outlines. Uh, the first outline is there's only one way. We'll take a look at Romans 21. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. We'll take a look at that in just a second. And then there is nothing to boast about. Romans chapter 3, verses 27 through 30. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Let's take a look at that first outline. Would you mind reading for me? Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. And if you would, uh, would you read that? If you lend your Sunday school books, let's read that in the King James Version. Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified as the grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed. Just and the justifier of him has in Jesus Christ. All right. Romans, the book of Romans is Paul's greatest work. It is placed first among his 13 epistles in the New Testament. One of the factors contributing to his placement after the book of Acts is that in the book of Acts, Paul, the book of Acts ends with Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Now, this is a very important statement. While the four Gospels present the words and works of Christ, of Jesus Christ, Romans explores the significance of his sacrificial death. Romans is, and I hate, I hate to do this, but I hate to say this, but it is probably one of the most important books in the Bible. It is a book you should be intimately familiar with. Using a question and answer format, Paul records the most systematic presentation of doctrine in the Bible. This is, one of, this is one of the main reasons I'm an advocate of Bible reading. I, I, this is just me now. This is just me. I don't have, I don't put a whole lot of stock in devotional reading. I don't put a whole lot of stock in that because the Bible needs to be read from cover to cover. And I always say it like this. Bible reading leads to Bible study. Bible study leads to a sound biblical, uh, sound biblical, a sound system, biblical and a sound systematic theology. You need to be able to think theologically, and you cannot do that jumping all over the Bible. I, this is how I say it. I say it like this. Watch this. Watch this. You're in school. You're trying to learn your timetables. Everybody with me? You start with one. One times one equals one, right? And then you go all the way through, correct? You don't go one times one equals one. Three times two equals six. Five times four equals 20. You don't jump around learning timetables like that. Okay. True or false? You don't. And you will not learn your Bible jumping from here to there, then over to here then back over to there, and so on and so on. You will not learn the Bible that way. You must learn to read the Bible from cover, from Genesis to Revelation, and in your study of the Bible, you are asking one simple question throughout the book. What is God making known about himself? Because that's what I really want to know. What is God making known about himself? 
So using a question and answer format, Paul records the most systematic presentation of doctrine in the Bible. Roman is, Romans is more than a book of theology. It is also a book of practical exhortation. I got, I got on my soapbox, and I apologize for that, but that's a soapbox that I don't mind being on. Not bad. You did good. Yeah. It, it, all right. Let me, let me go. <laughs> the good news of Jesus Christ is more than facts to be believed. It is also a life to be lived, a life of righteousness befitting the person justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The letter was written at the close of Paul's third missionary journeys. The letter was written, therefore, in the late winter or early spring of A.D. 57 or 58. Paul had as his plan, Paul had as his plan, now if you're familiar with the book of Acts, which we are going back into, uh, and again, I think I told you before, when I was in seminary under Dr. Black, Dr. Black made an indelible impression upon us on how important the missionary journeys were. Because it is through the missionary journeys that we get the New Testament as we know it. And so it is at the end of his third missionary journey. Now, he's gone through about three missionary journeys. And in those missionary journeys, he has written a number of epistles. And at the third, at the end of the third missionary journey, he writes this book of Romans to a church he had not he had not visited. He had never been in Rome. Well, he probably had been in Rome, but he had, he had not visited the churches in Rome. And so Paul had as his plan, you'll see this in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Romans. Let me just stick to my notes. Paul had, had as his plan to take the gospel to Spain. He had as his plan to take the gospel to Spain by way of Rome, but was previously hindered because his ministry was so extensive in Asia Minor and the Grecian Peninsula that he had not yet been free to look beyond Rome to Spain. So he writes in the first chapter, in the first chapter, in verses 13 through 15, I'm in the book of Romans, the book of Romans, he writes in verses 13 through 15, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. His hope was to come to Rome. Now, he didn't get to Rome the way he wanted to get there. <laughs> he, he, he went to Rome as a prisoner, as it turned out. But his hope was to come to Rome and share the gospel and seek their help in bringing the gospel to Spain. He writes in chapter 15 of the book of Romans, I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first I may enjoy your company for a while. All right. So his plan was to go and uh, go to Rome and then by way of Rome, go to Spain to spread the gospel but of course, he ends up being imprisoned in Rome. Uh, he, I think he was imprisoned in Rome t twice, and the second time he was beheaded. All right. All right. So in the book of in the book of Romans, Romans one through seventeen, Romans chapter one, verse one through seventeen, is Paul's salutation to the church at Rome. Now, verses sixteen and seventeen set the stage. Uh, for the significance of the revelation of the righteousness of God and the means by which it is, in, it is acquired. And so you see in verse 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 1, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. And then from chapter 1, verse 18, from chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, Paul asserts that righteousness is needed by sinful men. All right? Righteousness is needed by sinful men. This is, the, this is building up now to where we are in chapter 3. Now, he first shows that 
the unrighteousness of the Gentiles. If you're in chapter 1, he shows the unrighteousness of the Gentiles. He does that from verses 18 to 32. All right? And then he shows the unrighteousness of the Jews. He shows the unrighteousness of the Jews. That's in chapter 2, verses, or chapter 2 through chapter 3, verse 8. And then he levels the playing field. <laughs> he levels the playing field in his condemnation of everybody. We are all condemned. He does that in chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. This is highlighted in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. He says, what then? Are we better than they? He's talking about the Jews. Not at all, for we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks, that all are under sin, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. All right, everybody with me? One commentator, actually, is J. Vernon McGee. He breaks it down this way. And so we see in chapter 1, verse 17, through chapter 3, verse 20, righteousness needed by sinful men. Righteousness is needed by sinful men. And then in chapters 3, verse 21 through 26, this is actually where we are now. The righteousness that is needed is provided by God. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you how he did it, why he did it, uh, and another one in there, but it's how, I'll, I'll get it in a minute. And then in verses 20, verses 327 through 425, he shows that the righteousness provided by God is received by faith. All right? Now, we've already talked about, we, especially we talked about last, last week, we talked about um, the Abrahamic covenant and why that set forth the Jew as being first. And as a matter of fact, it even hits it right here in the first, first verse of chapter 3. But now Paul is making the transition from the Abrahamic covenant to the new covenant. The new covenant that you and I are a part of. The new covenant that represents the third, or that represents the church age. In the third chapter of Romans, we see before us, what is probably, and I, this is why I was stumped when I couldn't, couldn't get anything together uh, as I was trying to put this together. We have in this chapter, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, what I think to be the most important paragraph in the entire Bible. The most important paragraph in the entire Bible. Uh, and so let me direct your attention to a few phrases. To, and this is what I preached on, so now it gets easy. <laughs> but let me direct your attention to three phrases. Three phrases. If you're looking at verses 21 through 26, you see the phrase manifested. Everybody see that? I want you to see these three words or these three phrases. In verse 25, you see the words God publicly displayed. And then in verse 26, you see the words, for the demonstration of his righteousness. Everybody see that? Paul explicitly depicts our justification by faith in Jesus Christ through the use of these phrases. Through the use of these three phrases manifested in verse 21 for the, the manifestation spells out what God did. Spells out what God did, displayed publicly in verse 25, declares how God did it. Displays how God did it. And then for the demonstration of his righteousness in verse 26, that answers the question, why he did it? That answers the question, why he did it? Manifested in verse 21, for the manifestation spells out what God did, displayed publicly in verse 25, declares how God did it, and for the demonstration of his righteousness in verse 26, answers the question why he did it. And in so doing, 
Paul declares this, the means in which our iniquity is taken away and our sins are forgiven. Anybody need me to repeat anything? Go ahead. 21, the word, yeah, the uh, manifested in verse 21 spells out why he did it. What he did, what God did. I was just saying if you were paying attention. <laughs> Manifestation spells out what God did, displayed publicly in verse 25, declares how God did it. And then for the demonstration of his righteousness in verse 26 answers the question, why he did it. All right, all I got to do is look at my notes. I'll be just fine. Okay. <laughs> Dave texted me. He said, <laughs> Dave texted me. He said, if, if you're going to have notes, you need to have them to Jody by 430. I said, Stud, you're stretching it. <laughs> I didn't finish till 4 o'clock this morning. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it was a rough night. <laughs> so look with me at uh, verse 21 and see what God did. Look with me at verse 21. It says, but now apart from the law, righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The statement but now is used by Paul to mean that in contrast to any attempts to be justified by the law and thus assume righteous." The depravity inherent in our flesh makes it impossible for us to meet the demands of the righteous requirement of the law necessary for our justification. There is no way, no way, shape, or form we could be justified by the law. Everybody got that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For it is not following the letter of the law that commends our righteousness before God, but it is the spirit undergirding the law that leads us to loving the Lord our God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the letter of the Mosaic Law serves at the, as the means in which each and every one of us is held accountable before God. If God's going to put you in hell, he's got to have a reason to. Uh -huh. okay. And the law serves as that reason. As such, our condemnation before God is just and stands firm because, as we'll see in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is there anybody in here other than Carmen that has not sinned? <laughs> oh, Portlock hadn't. <laughs> for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Consequently, no one can boast in his ability to keep the law. Has anybody seen the Israelites united in Christ? Has anybody seen them? They, I, I don't think they are as prominent here in L.A. and Riverside as they are in Memphis and in the Midwest. And they are very adamant of how they keep the law. And I, was, I, I just want to ask one of them one time. I said, sh sh show me. Sh it is evident that no, no flesh is going to be justified by the law. And I want to know what they say about that. And I have a, I have a good friend of mine. He is knee deep into that. He even, he even funds it. I'm going, oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. But consequently, no one can boast in their ability to keep the law. And if you look at verse 20, verse 20 in chapter 3. It says, because of the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Through the law comes the knowledge of our depravity before God. As such, the law serves as a means of pointing out our total depravity before a holy and righteous God. Paul contends that now apart from the law, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. He contends that the righteousness of God, the very means in which you and I stand justified and have been declared righteous before God, the very means in which we have been made at peace with God, the very means in which we have a right standing before God, has been manifested. 
It has been revealed. It has been made clear. Don't miss the theological implication of the phrase has been manifested. Don't miss the theological significance of that phrase. Here it goes. It gets thick now. Real quick. Yeah, how can you tell if uh, God has given you over to uh, a reprobate mind? I mean, what, you just don't have any uh, conscience no more for sin, or what? Is that what, it, is that, is that, what that means? Uh, I, I, I agree with you. No more conscience? You just got a dead conscience towards the sin that you engaged in? Is that what, is that is that uh, the meaning that I get that you get the same now you you're, you're, you're touching an issue that's very sensitive to me. Okay. You, you're touching an in, a, 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 a situation that's very sensitive to me because, okay. and I'm just gonna be point blank. Okay. I believe my son has been turned over to a reprobate mind. Okay. I I, I just I just believe that. Yeah, because he calls himself yeah, a Christian. Yeah. But he says his name is Victoria. <laughs> Imagine that. No, and, man. And, and we, you remember, we, and, and okay, I, I, I don't know if I told you guys, but yeah, when we went to, uh, we went and celebrated our 30th anniversary in Puerto Vallarta, and I wanted my son to come. Yeah. And my son told me, he says, Daddy, he says, if I come, I'm coming as a woman. Imagine that. <laughs> I didn't tell him to stay home because I wanted him to. I wanted him to. I said, I don't care. If you, you, you come as anything you want. But he swears that he's a Christian. Now, if that is not a reprobate mind, I don't know what is. Yeah, and what's a, interesting oh, to yes, me, me. Yeah. is what's interesting to me is some of these people, they feel like if they call God by some other name, that that just makes them more justified than what they are. He goes, Yasha, Yasha, who are mama, see or something like that. He, he, he's, you know, I just talked to, I just talked to him the other day, you know, <laughs> But I believe he is. I believe he has a reprobate mind. So that's yeah. why that. So yeah, I, I I can relate to that because you know back in the day, you know before you know I really got serious about being a Christian. I I, I had a I had a hardness. I mean, uh, I, I, I I was able to sin without no conscience, man. I was able to do wrong and not really feel no regret about it. But now you know it's like uh, there's a verse in uh, in uh, chapter two of Romans talking about. Uh, uh, you know, God leads you to God leads you to, to a repentant lifestyle. That That's is, the that God, is. the Holy Spirit. You know, He convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So basically, all everybody has that in this room. You have a conscience because you know. I know back in the day, I don't. I I I was able to do wrong, Greg, and not have no regrets. Amen. I was able to sleep like a baby at night. Okay. But I got saved, man, and I said, man, boy, uh, hey, I can't do that no more. But I'm, you know, I'm a sinner, man, saved by grace. Amen. I got to claim that title for real, though, because, you know, I still work through things today, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm a work in progress, man. But we all are. You feel me? Yep. And so that's, what, that's why I wanna, I'm going to leave that alone at that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Don't start laughing at me, man. <laughs> All right, so don't miss the theological implication of the phrase has been manifested. Here's where it gets thick. The verb manifested in the Greek tense or in the Greek text is perfect tense, passive voice, and it's in the indicative mood. Now, you know I'm going to explain all that to you, so don't, 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 don't check out on me, Sister Reese. <laughs> don't check out on me just yet. <laughs> okay. Remember, the indicative mood stresses the reality of the manifestation. The indicative mood is going to stress the reality of the manifestation. The divine passive voice is clearly indicated here, and that means that the this indicates that it is God who is behind the manifestation. It is God who is ma who is making this perfect cl perfectly clear. All right, yeah, yeah. and then the perfect tense means that the action, the manifestation, was completed in the past was completed in past, and most importantly, it has everlasting ramification. Paul captures the essence of what was manifested in the past and his lasting ramifications. He captures that in Ephesians chapter 1. Right, right. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We have been blessed. What God has done for you has already been done. Everybody with me? And it is God who has done it. You cannot, this is why the Sunday school lesson says, no need to boast. Because there's nothing you can boast about. It is God who is making the manifestation. It is God who is bringing about all of our salvation, okay? It was manifested in the past that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. I love the fact that God already sees the process of my sanctification completed. Even though I am still working some things out, even though in me there are things, I I still have issues that I am working out. But God sees those issues as already worked out. He has already set before, he has set me before himself blameless. Everybody with me? Through Jesus Christ. You bet it is. It was revealed in the past that in love, he, bre- he predestined us to the adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. It is made perfectly clear, crystal clear, that in the past, that we would be to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. I tried to make the point uh, in one of the previous classes of how important grace is. It is grace. It is the grace of God that we have been, been, been I, I think, Pastor, you said we have been gracified. <laughs> we have been gracified. We, the love, the mercy of God that you and I enjoy as the process or as a byproduct of being gracified, being overshadowed with his love, his mercy, and his grace. Amen. Everybody there? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that out of yourselves. Uh, It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What was it then that God did? Because this is what we're talking about. We're talking about what God did. God manifested long before the foundation of the world the praise of the glory of his grace in that you and I were predestined conform to the image of the Son of the living God. And that transformation is by the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, shed on Calvary's cross to meet the demands of his uncompromising holiness. I'll get on that soapbox in a minute, but let me just stay with my text. The righteousness that you and I enjoy, the righteousness that you and I enjoy is what we call an imputed righteousness. Jesus Christ, imputed, (laughs) imputation (laughs) was a two-way street. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? It's a two-way street. Your sins, my sins, were imputed to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. Does everybody understand? That's a rhetorical question. This is the major distinction between what we believe and what Catholics believe. Do you understand that the reason a Catholic dies and goes to purgatory? Because he does not have enough righteousness. And so they have to go through all these motions to uh, try to reduce their time in purgatory. Everybody with me? And it's the Pope that has what's called the keys to the treasury of merit. The treasury of merit is the righteousness that was achieved by Jesus Christ, by all of the saints. And so if you don't have enough merit to go to heaven, you go to purgatory. Everybody with me? But we have been imputed with the righteousness of Christ. We don't have to spend one fraction of a second in purgatory. Why? Because of the righteousness that has been imputed to us by Jesus Christ. He took on our sin. We took on his righteousness. Everybody there? All right. That's what God did. 
The righteousness that you and I enjoy is an imputed righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right? Now we need to look at that phrase displayed publicly. Everybody still with me? Still got time. Still got time. Displayed publicly is how God did it. I'm going to take a look at how God did it. In verse 25, Paul tells how God did it through the life, through Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. For it is Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Everybody still with me? All right, don't want to lose anybody. What follows is the most intriguing dilemma confronting the minds of theologians for centuries. And this is, this is one of the things that Dr. Sam Mikulowski uh, put before us because this, this was profound. How is it both true? How is it both true that on the one hand, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and on the other hand, God was in Christ reconciling himself, reconciling the world Unto himself. It is affirmed in our text that the manner in which both these statements are true. Did everybody understand both statements? Yes. How is it both true that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and at the same time, and this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It is affirmed in our text that the manner in which both of these statements are true is in the fact that our redemption is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. The word displayed, here we go again, getting into the Greek. The word displayed is in the middle voice, stressing the fact that God is acting on his own behalf. Right, right. Okay, okay. Right. God is acting on his own behalf. This is why we have no reason to boast. Right. Right. God is doing all of this. Right. God is acting in response to his own uncompromising holiness. Yeah. Okay. It is God who is propitiated. It is God who is appeased. It is God who is satisfied. And at the same time, it is the sprinkling, it is the sprinkled blood shed on Calvary's cross by Jesus Christ that covers the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Okay. Now, I told you what propitiation means. I told you that propitiation was different from expiation. Expiation was what we had in the Old Testament sacrificial system, and I told you that expiation only covered sins. Right. Okay. Only covered sins. And this is one of the reasons, this is one of the things that God is talking about when he, or the text is talking about, it said, in the forbearance. Because God knew that the Old Testament saints couldn't be saved by the sacrificial system. And so they were saved on credit. God said, I'm going to put you in the layaway. <laughs> and, your, and your debt will be paid when Jesus Christ dies on the cross. So they, they're all put in the layaway. But everybody with me? But this is what the Old Testament sacrificial system did. All it did was cover sin. But Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sin of the world. Your sin has been taken away. Let me get back over here. That's the, that's the gist of propitiation. And the, the word means, and I told you what the word means, but I didn't, one, one aspect of it that I didn't tell you was propitiation means the mercy seat. Mercy seat in, the, in that tabernacle. But remember now, we're not talking about the tabernacle made on the earth, but we're talking about a heavenly tabernacle, for he entered the tabernacle not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood, he entered into the holy place once and for all, having obtained our eternal redemption. I got 20 minutes. I still got time. Yes, sir. All right? So we have before us, remember now, he was displayed publicly. Yeah. Yeah. And he is displayed publicly every Sunday in yeah. every sermon. 
We have before us the public display of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We have before us the public display of his suffering. We have before us the public display of him being wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. We have displayed for us publicly him who knew no sin being made sin for us. We have before us display, the public display of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But why a public display? Paul says it best. He says it best in verse 25. We're still in chapter 3, verse 25. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. This was to demonstrate the uncompromising demands of God's righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. The public display was necessary for you and I to see that the holiness of God is uncompromising. All right. let, me, let, me, let, me, let me draw this for you so you can see it. Because so many people... Ah, let's see how much time I got. 20 minutes. That clock right? That's, it looked like it was on 20 minutes the last time I looked at it. <laughs> I got my timetables up there. <laughs> this is the love of God. The love of God is never expressed outside of the holiness of God. Never. Never. God never has and never will compromise his holiness. This is why, this is why you can't live two lives. If you think, well, the love of God is going to cover me. Romans 6, chapter 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. The love of God is never expressed outside of the holiness of God. And the love of God always has as its purpose redemption. Everybody get that? We're talking about striving towards sinless perfection, right? No, we're not, because we'll never get there. We we'll never to, get there. To make an effort to, to obtain that, am I right? By the presence, the power and the presence of the abiding ministry of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Okay. That's why, I, here it goes. Yeah. That's why I always say, Christians don't sin because they're weak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Christians sin because they want to. Yeah. When a Christian sins, he is a, he's exercising his power. <laughs> he's exercising a power because God has given him everything he needs not to sin. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. But with every temptation, he will make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. If you are being tempted with it, if you are being tried with it, it's because God has already given you the ability to overcome it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. All right, I got to go. Yeah, because the hand's moving on the clock now. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I, I, I lost what page I'm on. Here we go. The public display was necessary for you and I to see that the holiness of God is uncompromising. God never has, never will <laughs> compromise His holiness. The forbearance of God was not based, and this is, I, I love this. I love this. This is the difference between Calvinist theology and Arminian theology. Okay? This is the difference between. Calvinistic theology and Arminian theology. The forbearance of God was not based on him seeing what we would do. It is not based on whether or not we would accept him as Savior 
for that theology is a works-based theology. In other words, God didn't save you because he looked down the road in the future and said, oh, she's going to worship me and she's going to save me or, or, or have faith in me, so I'm going to save her. Oh, no. That's Arminian theology. That is a works-based theology. Everybody with me? God saved you as a result of his sovereign choice. Everybody with me? Election. The forbearance of God was based on the sovereignty of God and the glory of his grace that he has blessed us in his beloved son because he knew what he would do. He knew what he would do, not what you would do. So not only do we have a public display of the humiliation of his only begotten son, we have a public display of the mercy and the grace of God and his death, burial, and resurrection. And three days later, he rose from the dead. Yeah. And we have before us the resurrection from the grave with all power in his hand. And the Bible affirms that he was raised for our justification. Yeah. What does justification mean? Tell me. Somebody tell me what it means. Come on, you got to know this one. This one you got to know. <laughs> yeah, justified by faith, we got peace with God, justification. What God does God. justification mean? What Just does it mean? All right, everybody get your pen out. Get your pencil out. Go ahead, Gwen. I'm guessing, I'm guessing now. No, no, come on, come on. Say it again. You got to go to the mic. No, I ain't going to make yeah. that. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. To be justified before God, it is a judicial act of God. Let me get, let you write that down. A judicial act of God. A judicial act of God whereby you are declared righteous. It is a judicial act of God in which you are declared righteous. That's going to be on the next test. <laughs> what is the difference between sanctification and justification? Okay. Justification is a state. Just like, let me look around. Let me, I don't want to miss anybody. Just like you black. <laughs> How many of you got to try to be black? <laughs> Justification is a state of being. It is a juice, judicial act whereby I am declared righteous before God as opposed to sanctification, right, right. sanctification is the process. Okay. Okay. And I like saying it like this. Sanctification is the process of me becoming what I already am declared to be. Okay. The process, I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> sanctification is the process in which I am becoming what I already am or what I have what I have been declared to be. Sanctification, that is the whole goal of discipleship, is your sanctification. God is working in you to bring you to where he already declares you to be. Everybody get that? This is part of it. Exactly. And the sanctification is accomplishing you by the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit of the living God. It is God who is doing the work. All you have to do is cooperate. Yield. <laughs> Be obedient. Everybody with me? All right, where, where, where am I? Oh, that clean hand's still moving. But we're going, we're going to finish this. We're going to finish this. I'm still, <laughs> we're going to finish this. All right. Uh, let's see. The Bible says, okay, God's public despair of Jesus, man. God's public display of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection from the dead is how it is both true that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that God is in Christ reconciling the world of, to himself. The public display, the public display is how God did it. This is how he did it. 
This is how God secured our eternal redemption. And then we say for the demonstration of his righteousness, Paul is even more specific as to why God did it when he says in verse 26, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be, now this is important, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. We have before us the public display of our suffering servant, our suffering savior, meeting the righteous demands of a holy and righteous God, and the evidence that the righteous demands of a holy and righteous God is met, the evidence that he is the propitiation for our sins, the evidence that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ is our Lord's resurrection from the dead. Because on that third day morning, he rose for our justification. That is the, that is the, that is the seal of judgment. God has passed his judgment upon you, and in that judgment, you have been declared righteous. God publicly displaying the death and burial of Jesus Christ. He has publicly dis displayed. Now watch. I'm building up to something. He has publicly displayed that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He has publicly displayed that the punishment rendered on the cross matched the magnitude of our transgressions. He has publicly displayed that by the shedding of blood of the sacrificial lamb of God, by shedding his blood, he has publicly displayed that he is a just God. Everybody with me? He is just because the death of Jesus Christ reveals the uncompromising holiness of an, un, of an uncompromising God. God never has and never will compromise his holiness. Remember I told you the three illustrations of God's uncompromising holiness was number one. Number one, the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom, the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom, and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. All of these serve to demonstrate the uncompromising demands of a holy and righteous God. And it shows, now watch, that God is holy and the righteous God is just. Because the, the, the what, let me just go back here and say, the punishment rendered on the cross matched the magnitude of the transgression. Everybody with me? Well, three. <laughs> oh, okay. I make this stuff up. <laughs> as soon as I make it up, I forget it. The three, the three. <laughs> the Syrian captivity of the northern of the northern kingdom, A S S. Syrian, A S S R Y I A N. <laughs> A S S Syrian, R I A N, Syrian captivity of the Northern Kingdom. That happened in 721 B.C. That's all right. I love it when you take notes. 721 B.C. Okay. Northern captivity goes into a Syrian. Uh, the Northern Kingdom goes into Assyrian captivity. Then the Babylonian, a B Y L O N I A N, the Babylonian, now everybody understand that the Assyrian captivity, that's when the 10 tribes went into exile. Then the Babylonian captivity was in 605, 605, that was the first deportation, and then the, what is it, 586 or 7? 606. 606. Eight, okay, yeah. So from 606 all the way down to 586, there were three deportation, deportation of the Jews. This is where you get Daniel and so on and so forth. Okay? And the third one is the death of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you can, she, she can spell out. <laughs> these are the three, these are the Three examples of God's uncompromising holiness. He didn't take no stuff. And, and see, this is what you got to understand. This is what you got to understand. If he didn't take any mess off the Jews, right. 
what makes you think he's going to take mess off the church? And you want to know where that one is? Revelations. How much time I got? Chapter 3. Uh, I'll say Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And that's where God is putting the church in check yes, yes. through the seven letters to the churches in Asia. All right? All right, let's go. We're going to, well we'll, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get it done. All right. Let me see where I am. Okay, if, if it were not for the uncompromising demands of the holiness of God, there would have been no need for the incarnation. Everybody remember what the current incarnation is? There would have been no need for a suffering beside. There would have been no need for the death of our Savior. Now watch. I'm building up to my next point. And as a just judge, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us to meet the righteous demands of his holiness. And it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now you got to get this. It's through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone that we are declared righteous for he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and God, in raising Jesus Christ from the dead, he has publicly displayed that he is not only just, but he is the justifier. He is the justifier of the one who has faith in his Son. For he who was delivered over because of our transgressions were raised for our justification. And that is why he did it. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. The price paid for our redemption is paid in full by him who is just and the justifier of all who repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so the second outline says, where is boasting then? Which one of us can boast? Because it's God who has done everything. Everybody with me? Where is boasting? It is excluded. By what? Law? Is it by the law or of works? No. But by the law of faith. Because we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ knowing that he has done it all. I, I can't, beat my, can't beat my chest under any circumstances. All right? Where then is boasting? It is included by what? The law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, 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 verse 28, we conclude, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the law. I think this is the verse that changed Martin Luther's life. They were going, the Catholic Church was trying to put all these restrictions and so on and so forth. But no, Martin Luther said, we are justified by faith and by faith alone. Right. Everybody with me? Yeah. And here's where we make the transition. Remember I talked about the, Abra the Abrahamic covenant and now the new covenant? Or is he the God of the Jews only? No. Is he not the, also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And... Uh, I don't know if it was on the, it may have been on the night shift that Chris McShann asked the question. He says, well, why does the Bible say that God is no respecter of person? That was last week. That was last week. Yeah. Because in the new covenant, he is no respecter of person. In the new covenant, here we are, in the new covenant, and I got to be careful how I say this, the Jews have been set aside. In other words, the, the Abrahamic covenant associated with the Jew has been put on hold for the most part because the church is going to be made up of both Jews and Gentiles. But God is going to steal. There he is right there. You, you must have heard me talking about it. <laughs> I, I revisited your question. How, how is it that God is not a respecter of persons? In the new covenant, in the new covenant, there is no distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. Why? Because the Jew and the Gentile now make up the body of Christ. They make up the church. We are in the church age. Everybody got, got that? But God is going to take the church out, 
And in taking the church out, this is in Romans chapter 11, he is going to provoke the Jews to jealousy because now they are going to see that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Messiah. And now God is going to reinstate, if you will, or continue with the Abrahamic covenant in the restoration of the Jews in, in, in fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. Everybody there? So since, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? I'm in verse 29. Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God, here it is, here's the church. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Anybody with me? Do we not, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. We establish the law. Why? Because the law is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. But if you are not in Christ Jesus, you will be judged according to the law. And I got a feeling that you won't, if you're going to stand there and turn right into smoke. If God was to judge us by the law, none of us would stand. None of us would stand. Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to let that one go, Pastor. <laughs> The, the statement, by faith and through faith. <laughs> yeah, I was going to run out of time. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor. Pastor would, you, Pastor, would you address that one, please? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trying to get you out on time. <laughs> and not only that, but we established a new covenant in which you and I are uh, are a part of the church age. And the only reason I didn't address it is because I didn't have time to get my notes together on that one. <laughs> but I certainly saw it, Pastor. I certainly saw it. All right, any questions? Don't ask that question, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> oh, that's, 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 that's what Sister Livingston told me. Sister Livingston, I don't know. <laughs> All right, any questions? Anything I need to repeat? That is your Sunday school lesson for us. <laughs> I'll, I'll have it, I'll, Pastor, I'll have it ready for tonight. <laughs>